to the Hudson Institute. I'm Brian Clark, a senior fellow at the Institute and director of the Hudson Center for Defense Concepts and Technology. Uh, and we are honored here today to have a couple of guests with us to talk about AUKUS, the Australia-UK-US uh, arrangement for technology exchange, which is uh, notionally about submarines, but as we'll discuss about a lot more. Uh, but with us today to talk about this is Marcus Hellier, a senior analyst at the Australian uh, Policy Strategic Policy Institute, uh, and Mark Gunzinger from the Mitchell Institute. Uh, they're both experts in their fields. Uh, Mar Marcus has been a senior official in the Australian government, advised on several programs, including the Joint Strike Fighter, among others. Uh, and Mark Gunzinger is a longtime command pilot in the Air Force, uh, and since his retirement has been a Deputy Ass Assistant Secretary of Defense, uh, as well as being on the National Security Council staff, and now at the Mitchell Institute, where he is a senior fellow and director of their concept development wing. So thank you very much, gentlemen, for, for being here today. It's a pleasure, and I'm really looking forward to having a great conversation with a nuclear submarine guy and a bomber guy, and maybe we can sort of work out the, the best way forward for Australia. We yeah. can reach some kind of uh, you know, agreement that you know, submarines and bombers are both cool. Absolutely, <laughs> but we do have you flanked here, so. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, super. So let's, uh, let's talk first about you know, AUKUS is, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, we're a year in now in AUKUS. Uh, there hasn't really been a huge amount of output from the program uh, or from the effort. Uh, the, they anticipate in the next six months or so we should start to see some of the decisions and some of the plans that might be a pursuit of it uh, come out. Um, it's fundamentally supposed to be about nuclear submarines being built in Australia. But what is, it, what is it that Australia is trying to accomplish with this and what is it that the U.S. and U.K. are trying to help Australia accomplish, Marcus? Well, it basically comes down to a five-letter word starting with C, so it's, it's all about China. So if we sort of go back a few years in time when Australia uh, ran a competition to pick its future submarine, nuclear submarines just weren't an option. You know, the, the US was not going to provide us with the, that technology. So we ran a competition uh, for a, a new conventional submarine and decided we would get uh, a French design. Ironically, it was, the starting point was a nuclear submarine. <laughs> and, and then we went into this very long design process to convert that to a conventional submarine. It was going to be a very capable uh, conventional submarine, probably the biggest yep. submarine, conventional submarine, longest range. And that sort of uh, uh, embodied the kind of problem Australia faces, is we sort of want to do things that other countries do with nuclear submarines in right. terms of range and endurance, but we right. just didn't have access yeah. to the technology. <laughs> a year ago, um, things had changed completely. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. what, had, what had changed was the threat perception amongst mm -hmm. the US and its allies and friends in the Indo-Pacific, mm -hmm. a growing recognition amongst all parties that if we wanted the US, our great and powerful ally, to remain engaged in the Western Pacific, everybody else had to step up yep. and do more. And we see the Japanese doing that, mm -hmm. we see the South Koreans doing that, Australia has been doing that, and this was kind of the next step. Right. So, you know, one of the things we've seen in the contrast between, say, Afghanistan and mm -hmm. Ukraine is that the, the US will help those who help right. themselves. Yep. And so we wanted to show that, you know, we wanted to do more right. and the US and uh, the UK sort of made that technology available to us. So the, yeah. this is all about China, but it shows how threat perceptions have fundamentally changed in the right. Indo-Pacific. And that's a great point that it is really about this, uh, creating this perception or creating this reality that the countries in the Western Pacific are trying to do better at defending themselves. They're not going to rely on the United States. They're not going to be free riders. Um, which has been the perception not among those countries necessarily, but in Europe, some of the countries have been mm -hmm. characterized in that in those terms. Uh, Mark, from a capability standpoint, what is it do we think that AUKUS is really trying to deliver? I mean, they're trying to, you know, help Australia better defend itself, but you know, what is it that the nuclear submarine, which is part of AUKUS, it, it, what capability is it that it's really trying to deliver? Because there may be other ways to deliver that capability that could be maybe a different path for the program. Yeah, uh, clearly there's a need to protect sea lines of communication in Australia, especially since uh, other allies, including the United States, uh, uh, would like to uh, uh, posture some of its forces, especially in a crisis in Northern Australia and, and other regions of, uh, of your nation, to deter and, if necessary, respond to a threat uh, generated by a Chinese uh, active aggression against Taiwan, South China Sea, whatever. Yeah. So I see where SSNs would be very useful mm -hmm. uh, 
to do that particular mission. But in terms of actually projecting power, especially offensive power, there are other options. And I would be interested in hearing if uh, Australia did take a look at some of those options uh, from a cost benefit, cost effectiveness perspective before they made the decision to proceed with uh, renewing its fleet of attack submarines. Now, obviously, I'm a, I'm a bomber guy, so I have a perspective on um, uh, bombers, especially uh, stealth bombers, and their ability to uh, carry a, a large number of weapons into the battle space for maritime strike, as well as other missions, including sea mining, and do that repeatedly day after day as they regenerate sorties. And uh, uh, that is indeed, every analysis I've ever seen that tells us that is, frankly, one of the most cost-effective means of, of doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it seems like, um, you know, what, so one of the challenges Australia has is it, it currently doesn't have a way of really retaliating for Chinese acts against it or anybody's acts against it, I mean, that are distant. Um, it can certainly retaliate locally, but if you want to go push back on China by attacking a Chinese target or even holding something at risk to deter them from being aggressive towards Australia, it seems like they really don't have that right now. And it seems like that's kind of what the AUKUS program, in a lot of, reason, well, a lot of ways, is reaching out for. Uh, would that be tr yeah, yeah, as well, true? Yeah, look, I, I, I agree. So what do, what do we want SSNs for? Well, I think ultimately it comes down to a long-range strike capability mm -hmm. that can operate several thousand kilometres mm -hmm. uh, north of Australia, it's, you know, into and beyond the, the archipelagos mm -hmm. to our north. And right. what we're really looking for is a, a conventional deterrent. So nobody in Australia is seriously talking about Australia getting yeah. a nuclear deterrent. Right. So that means we do need a, a very capable, high-end, mm -hmm. conventional right. deterrent. And uh, you know, I, I agree with with Mark that there, there are, are other ways to do that. And I am I am sort of looking at yeah. those other options, not as an alternative to, to SSNs. Our, our government has been very clear, including the, the new <laughs> government that came into power earlier this year that we, we are going forward with SSN. So I'm not trying to you know, challenge or repercharge <laughs> that decision. The, the issue is, is that whichever way I look at it, and I don't think I'm the only one here, is we are looking at probably 2040 to yeah. get the first mm, right. SSN. Yeah. And if you, I'm sure you're familiar with the sort of four for one rule of right. thumb that right. if you want to you know, consistently right. maintain one boat on operations, you need a fleet of four. Right. And so we're probably looking at 2050 yeah. uh, by that point. And the government has said that we're probably looking at uh, at least eight boats. So I right. think we're probably looking at about 2060 until we have right. that full capability. Currently, we have six conventional mm -hmm. submarines. They're sort of now roughly 20 years old. Right. They're aging. So to me, the, 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 the most pressing problem is what do we do to get through right. that long transition to right. a mature SSN right. capability? And I think that's the space where uh, potentially bombers could play a role. Um, right. You know, I, I've often said Australia has a kind of submarine fetish. We always yeah. default to submarines. So there's a lot of talk in Australia at the moment about getting a new conventional submarine yeah. to bridge that gap. And everybody has their, their favourites, so there's supporters of a French boat, a Swedish boat, German boat, mm -hmm. Japanese boat, South Korean boat. What I'm really trying to do is say, well, before we sort of default to that path, let's look at some of the other options right. out there. Yeah, yeah, very good point. I mean, I think, uh, it, like you said, uh, if you're going to have an indigenously built or indigenously assembled submarine in Australia, it will be 2040 before you can accomplish that. Um, and there's going to be a lot of challenges along the way in terms of you know, who, how are you going to free up the capacity from the United States or Britain to actually establish that capacity in Australia because both countries are tapped out right now with the construction of, in the U.S. case, Virginia and uh, Columbia, and in the British case, Dreadnought, you know, because it was take over from the astute. So there really is no spare capacity of, of people, which is a lot of ways the, the limiting factor mm -hmm. here is the workforce. That's already limiting a lot of the construction capacity in the U.S., I, I know, uh, and I think in Britain as well. So there's just no people to come and do it, even mm -hmm. if the money is available to start building the infrastructure that would allow the construction. Um, is there a, so in workforce is one of the issues that play here, mm -hmm. which is one thing I wanted to ask you both about is, uh, if there were, um, you know, so if you think we're gonna have a 2040, 2050, you know, kind of a, eventual submarine construction capacity in Australia, uh, and this is really in a lot of ways about jobs in Western Australia, mm -hmm. 
um, can, this al can an alternative plan yield jobs in Western Australia to satisfy that, that demand um, as opposed to uh, nuclear ship construction within that, the next 20 years, basically? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's, it's actually South Australia is, is our, sh okay. our, our submarine state. For, for some reason, the, the DNA of South yeah, Australians exactly. means that apparently Got they're it. the only people in Australia <laughs> who can build submarines. Well, so South Australia already has the, uh, the shipyard for major surface combatants, so mm -hmm. we are launching a very large shipbuilding mm -hmm. project in, in right. Adelaide to mm -hmm. build our future frigate. Mm -hmm. We're getting a, a British design, so which right. based on the, the UK Type 26 mm -hmm. design, which we've called the Hunter class. Yeah. And, and that will be a long, enduring kind of program. Right. Also, the deep maintenance of our current conventional submarines right. is done in the shipyard in Adelaide as well. Right. So there's actually quite a lot of work there. and. Um, I think there's a very real question. You talked about capacity constraints in the right. UK and in the US. We also have right. capacity constraints. So, you know, and this is one of the fundamental questions, I think, is if we acquire right. USN, U, SSNs, can we build them in Australia? Right. Can we do the whole thing in Australia? Do right. we do certain components right. in Australia? Can we do that? while we were, so we're about to start a very extensive upgrade of the right. Collins class yep. to keep it relevant and extend its life. Yep. That's a very huge piece of work. If you then throw into the mix a new conventional <laughs> submarine, that could, I right. think, kind of swamp our, right. our limited right. industrial capacity. And also, uh, there's no point getting SSNs unless you can maintain them of course. as well. And we've done a little bit of analysis on that, and it looks to me like the maintenance of a, an, an SSN mm -hmm. is about three times as much work as the maintenance yep. of a conventional boat. So you've got to make some prioritization mm -hmm. decisions there. What are the things that are most important to you? And what are the things that you either won't do at all or you will buy from right. overseas? Right. And, and uh, I think the issue, whichever path we go down, it, the, the problem is not going to be not enough jobs in Australia, but not enough people to do the work. That's kind of what I was thinking as well. Now, now Mark, if, if, if Australia goes down the path of maybe the alternative or the, the mitigation in the near term is bombers or uh, collaborative combat aircraft or uh, loyal wingman or, or both, know, different, right, or both, right? So there's combinations of capabilities that you know, could be aviation oriented that help provide this sovereign power projection capability. Um, could that kind of uh, set of capabilities be constructed in Australia? What's what's currently being done with regard to you know aviation programs there? Is there a lot of that? There's a uh, the the F-35 and a great deal of work going on in Australia, uh, in Australia, right. to develop what is now called collaborative combat aircraft. Other call them loyal wingman yeah. and, and wingman and so forth, uh, which also would complement a bomber and improve its ability to project mass at range and, and frankly, at, uh, uh, at less cost, right. possibly. So uh, I am interested when I hear arguments that focus on an industrial base, right. industrial base capacity and timing and ship, shipbuilding and right. so forth. I, I like to focus equally, at the very least, on the effectiveness in the a fight with a peer adversary and the cost effectiveness of those capabilities. If we're talking an attack sub that can carry a couple dozen uh, um, uh, Tomahawks or, or cruise missiles, whatever, that's a bomber sortie. Yeah. And once that sub has expended its ordnance, it must return to a secure port right. and reload since it can't replenish it. See, it taking it out of the fight for, well, perhaps months. Whereas the bomber can fly a sortie the next day, and the day after, and the day after. And when you talk about the offensive potential, the deterrence potential of uh, uh, bombers uh, relative to the SSNs, I, I think that uh, that is a consideration that needs to be made uh, and should share at least equal status with shipyards, the potential to manufacture in mm -hmm. Australia, and, and so forth. Yeah, <clears throat> it's a great point. I mean, ultimately, the defense budget is about acquiring effective military capability. Yes. Uh, Australia has sort of swung backwards and forwards on this issue of, do we try and do as much possible as possible in Australia in terms of um, industrial capacity, 
or do we buy off the shelf, you right. know, go, go to the global market and, and right. find the best thing for the best price? We've sort of swung backwards and forwards. Over the last decade, we went more to the, well, I guess this side, the do as much as right. possible right. in Australia yeah. uh, side. I think we're sort of swinging back a little because yeah. of the urgency of the situation, right. the, you know, the, the pressing kind of China threat. Right. And I think there's a realization that, well, actually we need capability quickly. Right. Right. You know, I, I would argue that um, they're not irreconcilable Kind of goals, and and here no, I'll, I'll, I agree. I'll make a plug for the loyal wingman. So, and, and it's now being re renamed the Ghost Bat. Exactly. Yes. Uh, uh, after a sort of Australian flying mammal, this yes, you know too. night predator. Uh, you know that was the first combat aircraft that had been designed in Australia since exactly. World War Two, and also the first combat aircraft that Boeing had designed outside of yes. the USA, right. and using um, you know fourth industrial revolution mm -hmm. type techniques, that went from concept to flying prototype in three years. So really quite remarkable. Mm -hmm. And so what I would argue is look at your industrial base, look at the things you're good at and right. where it can add value right. and, and focus on those things. And I would argue that things like UAVs, mm -hmm. artificial intelligence, advanced radars, mm -hmm. those kinds of high-end things are the things that where Australia can add Right. value to the AUKUS mm -hmm. partnership and don't go and duplicate that kind of brute industrial right. kind of capacity that yeah. exists already in, yeah. in our, our yeah. allies. And that's complementary and additive as, as you point out, uh, but you also mentioned the time frame of potentially getting a new class of uh, nuclear powered submarines, uh, 2040, I think I heard 2050 in there somewhere. Right. Uh, there are currently six uh, B-21s on the line. Mm -hmm. Uh, today, as we speak, announced by the Air Force at the mm -hmm. uh, uh, conference in National Harbor two weeks ago, uh, we expect that the operate uh, a number of those could be mm -hmm. operational aircraft, and uh, the production rate will ramp up mm -hmm. over the uh, the next uh, a few years. Uh, however, our Air Force still has the smallest budget of. Uh, or smaller than the Army and Navy, and they are modernizing uh, both legs of the triad, which they operate, and funding other critical modernization programs because they haven't funded them for 30 years mm -hmm. due to lack of budget. There's going to be pressure on the B-21. Mm -hmm. right. And that pressure is also going to be exerted on the B-21 acquisition program. Because mm -hmm. why? That's where the dollars are. My point being, perhaps, the acquisition rate that the Air Force can afford with the budget it is given would allow for some mm -hmm. excess production that could be used to uh, uh, essentially develop a B-21 force for Australia. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely worth investigating. So, so Mark, are there- And doing it sooner right. than 2040. Mm -hmm. but, but like we've done with the Joint Strike Fighter, are there opportunities for co-development? Because Australia has a long history in electromagnetic spectrum warfare, you know, CEA and other companies have done fantastic work that in a lot of ways is farther ahead than the United States and some of their capabilities when it comes to EMW, yeah. uh, you know, electronic warfare. Um, is there an opportunity for maybe co-development where we take the B-21 and, and, and I will say yes, here, or but in Australia? Absolutely, but I'll, I'll explain it this way. We're not necessarily talking about co-development of algorithms to uh, determine the outer mold line of the B-21. That's, right, that's right, already right, baked right, in. They have right. six on the line. But the B-21 is part of a family of systems for a long-range strike, and a lot of people forget about that. It was designed from the onset to be part of a family of systems, which includes weapons, mm -hmm unmanned aircraft, other manned capabilities. And that opens up the space for Australia to bring its know-how, its knowledge, its technology, its manufacturing capacity to bear to help flesh out the family of systems that would be optimized for Australia, to include loyal wingmen and CCAs, obviously. Yeah, I, I think that the Joint Strike Fighter program is a really nice mm -hmm. precedent. Whether, whether we're talking about SSNs or B-21, or other systems, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the Joint Strike Fighter program and Australia's involvement in that is a good precedent. We don't build right. Joint Strike Fighters right. in, a, in Australia. We didn't really have a role in designing mm -hmm. that, but a, a number of Australian companies are involved mm -hmm. in manufacturing components exactly. in that. 
And so it's, we, we have 72 JSF. You know, right. is, is it better to assemble 72 JSF, right. or do you get in on the ground floor and you produce components that go into a fleet of right. 3,000 JSFs, right. and you're part of the sustainment of that fleet for right. the next 50 years? Right. You know what? I, I'd argue it's that's a better model right. for us. And also, you know, Australia has now established a regional sustainment hub. Mm -hmm for right. the Joint Strike Fighter and sort of engine and work. that's is a done. good model too. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, so we are not just mm -hmm. um, maintaining Australia's fleet of right. JSFs, but all of the partners right. there. And, you know, whether we do SSNs or bombers right. or both, uh, I think that's a, the model we right. really should be looking at, again, rather than duplicating, you know, the, right. the capacity of our friends cool. and allies. Well, then let's step back and talk a little bit about the SSN again, because let's turn it back to me and submarines. But um, the... <laughs> The, so, but, the, uh, but this brings up a, a question. You know, so there's an opportunity here where for the United States uh, to, to provide Virginia-class submarines to Australia is going to be really difficult. I mean, one, just because there's no excess capacity, capacity. to build them. Mm -hmm. But right now, the U.S. is building the Block 5 Virginia SSN, which is the one with the Virginia payload module. Yep. It's a larger ship. It's slower. There's going to be you know, concerns about, do we, is this the submarine that we send to Australia? Um, or do you send existing ships, which are going to be the blocks that precede that, that mm -hmm. are just more traditional attack submarines? Which means the U.S. might actually have built submarines that they're going to want to share with Australia. And it seems unlikely that they're going to want to just sell those, although that could be an option. Uh, or they could be sent to Australia in some kind of shared arrangement where you've got dual crews, Australia, U.S., where Australians go through nuclear power training and, mm -hmm. and submarine training and go in and run these ships alongside their American counterparts. But that small number of American submarines could be joined by, or American-built submarines, could be joined by U.S. submarines that deploy to Australia. Mm -hmm. And you could have a sustainment hub in Australia that does the maintenance of those shared and also U.S. Uh, sovereign submarines. Is that a model that might be you know, akin to JSF, where you've got now this submarine or nuclear maintenance hub in, in Western or, or Southern Australia? Yeah, well, I, I recently put out a short piece in The Strategist, the, the SV online uh, journal, and I called it the damn the torpedoes yeah. approach, and that is you you don't go down the traditional approach yeah. of setting up this big program mm -hmm. and slowly building boats that delivers right. Right. T by 2040, right. 2050, 2060. And, and you just go, all right, yeah, we, we ended into AUKUS, mm -hmm. uh, A, to be able to do things faster, right. to leverage right. the, the capabilities of our, our partners. Mm -hmm. So what does that look like? And it's a very different kind of model. So yeah. Yeah, maybe the, the U.S. does transfer some boats mm -hmm. uh, without the U.S. Navy mutinying. Right. You know, I, I, I myself, I yeah. find it hard to believe the U.S. Navy would hand over its boats because of its own numbers crisis. Right. But let's say it happens. It could be, that could be the, but the administration may decide to make that decision because it could be beneficial because those submarines are now fully Correct. deployed in Correct. the Western Pacific. They're performing Again, the function you know, I will they would need to perform. You know, yeah. just repeat, a year ago, the whole right. AUKUS thing seemed unthinkable. Right. So. Right. You know, senior leaders can make in, in interesting yeah, and brave yeah, decisions. Yeah. But so maybe we trans the tr you transfer a few boats right. to Australia. You forward deploy some U.S. Right. Navy boats. You start building some sustainment capacity mm -hmm. by sending out a submarine tender. Right. <clears throat> we go down the co-crewing mm -hmm. path, and I'd note that both the U.S. and the U.K. have mm -hmm. have actually started that right. already. Yep. You're training Australian submariners. Uh, you know, so you kind of have a, a sort of messy sort of model. It's right. not your traditional sovereign right. uh, capability, which Australia owns and crews and can sustain itself. It would, I think, raise some interesting legal issues, you right. know, but these things aren't insoluble, I right. guess. So if you went down that path, you know, I think you, you can pick each one of those yeah. sort of potential things apart and say, that's not going to happen. Right. But collectively... Right maybe it could deliver some kind of an SSN capability right. in Australia, maybe by the mid-30s, right. perhaps. Right. But, you know, it's it's well, not your traditional approach. Right. Or, or if it's, it could be earlier. If the, if the U.S. deploys submarines to Australia, sends the Emory S land, which is a submarine yeah. tender down well, there, and then they set up shop like they did in Guam. That could happen tomorrow. Right. You know, right. and my own sense is, is that even if you take the slow traditional approach, mm -hmm. You're probably going to have to do all of that right. damn the torpedo stuff right. anyway, right. Right. just right. to start developing the crews and right. developing exactly. the, the local, you know, industrial capability. So, right. um, 
You're probably going to have to do both of those things. Yes, and you could still end up with the longer term submarine construction effort or just replace mm -hmm. the Collins class down the road. I mean, this might be just the shorter term well, segment of what is a longer term effort. Yeah, well, yeah. I think that, that's an interesting point is let's say you had something mm -hmm. and you're confident you could get it done by 2035. Right. Then you, you, do you even try and keep the columns going? Right. You know, do you spend billions and billions yep. upgrading right. this 1980s yeah. kind of Technology. pedigree right, right. design and just go, no, we're, we're not going to do that right. and we'll free up those human resources, financial resources, industrial right. resources and sort of double down on the, the SSN path. Right. And have a small set of US and Australian submarines to start with that yeah. then eventually turns into yeah. an indigenous program. Yeah. I think it, once you break free of that kind of traditional yeah. model and yeah. go, all right, we're in a different yeah. space now with AUKUS, it does open up right. some quite radically different possibilities. Yeah. Right, and, and Mark, so they think there'd be an opportunity there for like a complementary capability. So a small number of SSNs that are transferred from the US or shared with the US or are deployed by the US now could be complemented with aviation capabilities. You know, These are exactly the kinds of conversations that I hope our governments are having. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not a binary choice in, in my right. book, and either or oh, a proposition. I, I agree entirely. I think yeah. both uh, tax subs and and bombers would be a great choice for us. So you, you really don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. And so to answer your question, I see the potential for, in the near to midterm, Australia building a, a small force of, of bombers right. to do power projection, do offensive operations, do defensive operations, maritime strike, and all the other missions that mm -hmm. bombers can perform. Right. And in the longer run, a new class of uh, of submarines, maybe in the mid 2040s or so forth, uh, would uh, add to that capacity. So you are staggering your investments over time mm -hmm. to build a right. much more resilient offensive capability. And in the interim, the approach you were talking about would be a, a good gap filler as right. well. Right. And if that gave you some um, uh, ability to retire the Collins, mm -hmm. some Collins class subs uh, a little earlier to save resources, right. that would be. Uh, all, all the more to the good. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the, the line I've yeah. been using, or the question I've been posing, is is maybe the best interim submarine mm -hmm. capability we can get is actually the B-21 bomber. Right. <laughs> you know, it, yeah. it gives you the ability to, you, you don't put those billions of dollars into right. getting a new conventional submarine. Maybe it does allow you to retire columns right. a bit earlier. Right. It, so It would hedge, I, too. Sorry. I, it would hedge against risk yeah, yeah. of that new SSN. Exactly, you know, and w whichever path we go down with SSNs, there's a lot of risk involved. Yeah. And, you know, we are already, I've argued, in our sort of maritime mm -hmm. transition, we've already embarked on two high-risk right. programs. Yes. So it's, it's the, the SSN transition, right. but we also are undergoing yeah. a very similar transition with our surface yep. fleet. We, are, we have aging frigates, a industrial program being set up to replace them, but that's not going to deliver the first boat until well mm -hmm. into the 2030s. Right. Right. Um, you know, so our, our entire combat fleet is really facing a lot of big risks. Yeah. And so we, any sane business, any yeah. sane business right. would be hedging against those right. risks. Well, the reason I, I came, I come back to the idea of, you know, some kind of SSN arrangement that would be complementary to a bomber is because this is beneficial to the U.S. So the U.S. has a problem. Uh, the U.S. has a problem with submarine maintenance capacity mm -hmm. right now. We are right. unable to get submarines right. out of uh, their uh, dry docking overhauls on time. We have submarines that have been sitting for years waiting to get into maintenance periods that are unable to dive and therefore are useless to the fleet. Um, so establishing some maintenance capacity in Australia might actually be a way to expand that and you know, do you may have some cost sharing yeah. so that the U.S. would help pay for part of that, the Australian government yeah. would pay for part of that, and you'd be able to maybe do some more of the submarine maintenance overseas that we currently are doing in our small number of yeah. U.S. public shipyards. Uh, and then also you could have this uh, ability to forward deploy submarines even farther away than we do with Guam mm -hmm. uh, in a place that's maybe even better suited to accommodate yeah. more submarines because Guam is pretty much maxed out with the five we're going to have there now. Um, so having an additional, whatever, three, four, or five submarines that are based out of Australia would really be beneficial mm -hmm. to maintaining U.S. submarine presence as the fleet shrinks. Um, even if those submarines are not uh, U.S. wholly owned, they're you know, shared mm -hmm. with Australia. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of benefit to the United States of this idea of establishing a sustainment capability in Australia. Do, do, you, th do you think 
uh, that's a possibility. So I, I talk to a lot of people who go, oh, this all sounds good, but you know, the, those nuclear naval reactor guys, they're going to hold on to this. They're not going to let oh, us, so, uh, no, Australia do yeah. maintenance in, in Australia. No, absolutely. I mean, they, certainly that, I think especially if it starts out as a you know kind of U.S. led effort with a submarine tender that goes out there and establishes the initial capability. Uh, back in the Cold War, we did this overseas all over the place because we had SSBNs yeah. even stationed mm -hmm. overseas yeah. in Guam and okay. um, in the U.K. Um, and we would, used to do submarine maintenance in places like Diego Garcia and elsewhere. So submarine maintenance was being done overseas previously. Um, it was mostly being done by U.S. personnel on tenders, but the, I don't see there being any real significant. Uh, problem with that. I think part of AUKUS is intended to be more of a sledgehammer mm -hmm. to break through those yep. cultural barriers, which are really mm -hmm. not you know, legal necessarily. Um, there's also you know, a few regulatory hurdles mm -hmm. to jump through. If you're going to do regular maintenance of ships overseas, you've got to get some waivers from Congress, which I think AUKUS could be a real mm -hmm. way to, to work through. But the this U.S. Navy desperately needs this additional mm -hmm. capacity. So to me, you know, that's, that's a, an argument in favor of you know, sending some submarines over here, either U.S. owned and deployed or yeah. co-owned. And, and I, 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 to me, there's no point us getting SSNs right. if every time something goes wrong, right. you have to send it back, right. best case, to, to Hawaii and probably right. even back, back to the continental U.S. for maintenance. So right. That's not a viable capability. No, no. So you need the sustainment capability, which the U.S. would benefit from in the near term and then obviously longer term, mm -hmm. that would be beneficial to Australia. On, on that sort of damn the torpedoes approach, yeah. it, there's sort of, is interesting, uh, recently the U.S. Air Force deployed three B-2 bombers out to Australia. So uh, uh, there does seem to be some exploration going on in Australia. Yeah. Um, you know, bombers are not part of AUKUS, but there does seem to be yeah. some uh, consideration going on in Australia of, of what would, of reconstituting our bomber capability. Because we used to have bombers, and right. up until yeah, a, exactly. a decade ago, you know, it was only a decade ago that the F-111s were retired. And yeah. so we have a, a very long and distinguished <laughs> history with with bombers, so it'd be interesting on, on your views, Mark. How hard would it be for Australia to reconstitute a bomber capability? I don't think it'd be difficult at all. It, it is a heritage of your Air Force, uh, without question. The longer range missions to strike the offensive uh, uh, capacity was there, and reconstituting that, I don't think that would be a huge challenge either from a technical or operational perspective. In fact. Uh, getting Australia into the ground floor mm -hmm. of developing operational concepts as a family of systems, as I mentioned, with uh, combat uh, or CCAs and so forth, I think that would be uh, beneficial to our Air Force as, as well as, mm -hmm. as yours. So I think this is something that could benefit us both. Right. It's also one of the that area that I think you know, we haven't talked about yet, which I think offers an opportunity to also share technology with the UK is in uh, unmanned yeah. undersea vehicles. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, Australia just purchased or is under making an arrangement to purchase a, a vehicle from Anduril, yep. uh, which will be an extra large uh, autonomous undersea vehicle. Um, the missions of it are not really well defined at this point, probably surveillance or something, mm -hmm. but um, that could be an option to try to mitigate again some of the limitations that might come from what the Collins class will be able yeah, to do. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, as much as I like the idea of B-21, there, there are other kind right. of options right. to sort of get us through right. that gap to SSNs, and one right. is certainly uh, extra large un uncrewed underwater vessels, right. and, um, you know, the U.S. Navy has got its orca program uh, working with Boeing. Yeah. Interestingly, um, you know, we at Aspie had said, well, maybe this is something we should be exploring. Yeah. Interestingly, the Australian government and Department of Defence didn't go down that yeah. pathway um, and has uh, signed a contract with Anduril right. for 100 million US to develop three prototypes right. of a, a large uh, underwater vessel, and which, which is a good thing. You sure. know, it's definitely a path we should be going down. So. You know, I know it's a cliche to say we should be talking effects, not platforms, right. but we should be a talking effects, right. Right. not automatically defaulting to crude right. submarines right. and, you know, looking at what are the effects that we can deliver through right. other systems. So B-21 obviously would be a great right. ship killer, but, yeah, I, but, but large but, underwater vessels yeah. could deploy mines, they could right. be doing persistent yep. ISR, so a whole yep. range of effects that 
We don't necessarily need another submarine for. Right, and, and one of the things that we found in, in the work we've been doing is that undersea vehicles would be in a, uh, needed more and more uh, to do some of the suppression of undersea defenses. You know, so there yes. are undersea surveillance systems mm -hmm. like SOSIS that China and Russia have both deployed. Not necessarily launch weapons. Right, right, so they, someone's gotta go and map out those networks, yeah. someone's gotta go figure out how to attack them, someone's gotta jam them. Uh, adapt as decoys to allow submarines to get through. So increasingly that underwater environment is becoming contested just like above the water. Mm -hmm. um, so undersea vehicles like what you know is being built by Andro for Australia you know, could be useful in some of those contexts and make the small submarine force that Australia and the US have mm -hmm. you know, more, yep. more effective and more survivable. Yeah. One last thing I want to ask you, or one, one other capability, is uh, missiles, long-range yes, strike yes. missiles, because you know, I think those are in the, in, the, you know, in the discussion right now as well, hypersonics research yeah. uh, with hypersonic boost glide, prompt global strike type weapons. Um, you know, what, is the, you know, what is the utility of that for Australia as an alternative for this ability for sovereign power projection? Uh, and is that something that should be considered in the mix for this? you know, interim, messy, you know, yeah, portfolio. Yeah, well, definitely, it is, it is part of the mix, and we are doing, uh, so the government has uh, announced we're requiring longer-range missiles, so we are, we are requiring LRASM, so long-range right. anti-ship missile, the, uh, the, the longer-range version right. of JASM. Yeah. Uh, there's been some talk of uh, also acquiring Tomahawk land attack yeah. missile. You know, I, I think... Those land, land attack off our relatively small right. submarines right. and small surface fleet is a very poor investment. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I think bombers do that much more cost effectively. Right. But, you know, yeah, we, we need to be getting those kinds of missiles. But the bottom line is, is if you have, like our Air Force, based on tactical fighters, so, mm -hmm. so Joint Strike Fighter and right. Super Hornet, it, you know, they're, they're, the combat radius is about 1,000 kilometres. Yeah. Even if you tank them, right. put on a longer range missile, you're still kind of tapping out at two, yeah. two and a half thousand kilometers, right. which it's not bad, but right. when you map that onto the, yeah, the Indo-Pacific, <laughs> yeah. it's pretty limited. Plus, if you want to conduct that strike mission with, say, Super Hornets, right. you, you're going to need pretty much all of Australia's tankers. Yeah. We yeah. have seven air-to-air -air tankers. Right. You're probably going to need all of our AWAC aircraft. You're probably going to have to send Growler yeah. because it, everyone's going to see it coming right. a long right. way right. off. And so what you do some, some modeling and pretty quickly you are using every Air Force yeah. asset to sort of project a yeah. small number of, yeah. of aircraft with a right. small number of missiles. Right. Uh, out about 2,000 kilometres right, maximum right, right, range. Right. And that entire package is, you know, delivering what essentially one bomber right. can do right. by itself, yeah. Yeah. you know, without all of that kind of stuff. So then you go, well, yeah, but the next big thing is hypersonics, right. you know, then, and they can go, you know, three, 4,000 right. kilometres. Right. So there's like definitely, and I think quite rightly, some a lot of interest in, in hypersonics. Yeah. But I think you know what what the Mitchell Institute has done is it's one of the the only places that I've seen has actually done some comparative cost benefit right. analysis of yep. missiles versus bombers, and it, I think it's it's quite compelling the, the yeah, analysis you guys have service, done. Service service launch weapons, uh, uh, you need large rockets to get the the mass of the payload, mm -hmm. the warhead, up to altitude, and in terms of hypersonic weapons, mm -hmm. at very high altitudes and high speeds, right. so they can. Uh, reach to target, those rockets tend to be pretty large and quite expensive. Right. In the case of the Army's long-range hypersonic weapon, uh, 45 to $50 million mm -hmm. each. That's per target. Mm -hmm. A target that can be attacked with you know, Jasmine R for much, much mm -hmm. less uh, right. cost. So does hypersonic weapons make sense for Australia? Perhaps a very small number of them for very, very high-value targets but not at quantity. They are not a campaign level kind of weapon. Right. You, for that, you want something that can penetrate contested areas and carry weapons much closer to targets, and those weapons can be much smaller because they don't need to fly as long range, and you carry more of them per sortie, and they're a lot less expensive, and that conveyance vehicle, a bomber, can again fly day after day and continue mm -hmm. to deliver targets compared to a hypersonic weapon that costs 10, 20, 30, 40 million dollars to shoot right. once. Mm -hmm. right. 
Yeah, miss, missiles, th there's a role for missiles, but they're an extraordinarily expensive right. way to deliver a relatively small amount of high explosives. Right. And, yeah. and nothing on in that system is reusable. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, well, and, and in a lot of ways it also gets, you know, the submarine is a similarly pretty expensive platform to carry a relatively small number of weapons. Uh, the argument would be it's got some niche missions that it's going to be able to do in that, when it's doing strike. You know, yeah. So it's going to be able to hit certain targets uh, in advance of the bomber coming through that could be really beneficial. And then obviously it's got other things it does mm -hmm. other than strike. So it's, you know, got that other benefit, whereas the long range hypersonic weapon has basically, it's a one trick pony. Yeah. But, and, and this really gets us back to those fundamental questions, right. which we're not very good at talking about right. in Australia. And that is, what kinds of operations do you want the Australian yeah. Defence Force right. to do? Right. You know, what are your highest priorities? What do you, yeah, where do you want to, you know, focus your investment? Right. And that means prioritizing yeah. some capabilities mm -hmm. over others, and not every child gets a prize, you know, <laughs> some, some people are going to lose out. And that means having some pretty robust conversations. And what has the greatest uh, deterrence? Right. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And having some robust conversations yeah. about what can we rely on our allies for, and what mm -hmm. are the things we actually have yeah. to own ourselves, you know, in, at scale. Yeah. You know, and we're not good at having those conversations. Right. So we're a bit like the, the US Defense Department in, yeah, exactly. in, in microcosm in that you know, pretty even division between the three services, right. you know, not in completely even, but right. broadly speaking, quite right. even. And you go, well, is that actually, yeah. um, do we do that because it's convenient or do right. we do that because it makes the most sense? Right. And yeah. I, well, I, so when, but it does point out one thing is that, you know, one of the challenges for the United States is jointness, right? So how do you get yes. the services to play together? And part of how you achieve that is by forcing the services to be interdependent upon one another. So if the Navy really did depend on the Air Force to do some of its counter maritime mission, uh, because the Navy had no capacity to do it mm -hmm. or whatever, well, then they would be a lot more joint because the Navy yeah. would have to work with the Air Force to make sure that those right. counter-maritime missions got done. depend on the Air Force for air refueling. Right, but, and so in those areas, yeah. you see a lot of you know, exactly work right. to make sure that, hey, we'll make sure the Air Force has enough money mm -hmm. for their tanker fleet because we really yeah. depend on it too. Um, similarly, with AUKUS, part of the goal of AUKUS is to make the, let's get the U.S. and Australia and, and the U.K. married. You know, let's get them to the point where they are dependent upon one, each other, mm -hmm. one another in the Western Pacific in a way that you know, forces this you know, jointness beyond you know, that level and gets to a really alliance relationship. Mm -hmm. So if you had sustainment for bombers and submarines in Australia mm -hmm. and that we were dependent upon, well, that, that's, that's pretty well married up. Yeah, I was going to mention that. To yeah. Envision a future in a not too distant future where uh, our Air Force has B-20s as yours. They could uh, share munitions, share maintenance, mm -hmm. uh, and, right. and turn sorties at each other's bases mm -hmm. and so forth. Uh, Air, our Air Force bombers stationed in uh, Northern Australia, along with yours, makes a great deal of sense. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's a force multiplier for both of us. Yeah, and I agree. And if ultimately, you know, when we go back to what was driving this, the whole AUKUS project, it is about, you know, keeping the U.S. engaged right. in, in the Western Pacific, right. you know. And so the more we can do that, the, yeah. the better for everybody. But I have actually have one question for you, Mark, and that is whenever I raise the the B twenty one issue, people go, "Oh, oh, though that those stealth aircraft, those the, the coatings are terrible. It's you know they're so fragile and it's so expensive to maintain those those stealth aircraft, and you know a country the size of Australia just couldn't couldn't afford it." You're the expert yeah. here. Is it really? Is that the case? The F thirty five is not your mother's stealth fighter. The advances in stealth technologies, coatings, uh, sealants, uh, uh, from the F-22, and certainly from the F-21, it's night and day. The same is going to be true for the B-21. The maintainability uh, is gone from, you know, many tens of hours between sorties to single digit for uh, uh, our most advanced stealth aircraft mm -hmm. already. Even in the lifespan of those uh, stealth aircraft, as material has been improved, you see a precipitous drop in number of man errors required to maintain their uh, uh, low observable signature. Mm -hmm. And we're going to find that with a B-21 as well. It's right. not your mother's stealth bomb. Mm -hmm. uh, or your father's. Thanks. That's right. <laughs> well, thanks, Mark. Well, so it really does point out that there's a lot of opportunities for alliances to come closer together, you know, either through sustainment you know, or construction of these new capabilities and, and deliver on what AUKUS was promised to, to yes. be to it, instead of just being a 
you know, kind of a submarine program, it's, there's a lot more to it that could be explored if we really thought more about a, a messy point. portfolio. Yeah. Well, of there there are those eight other areas right. of, you right. know, the, the, the second track exactly. activities yeah. of, you know, uh, undersea warfare and artificial yep. intelligence and, and quantum. But, you know, there's, while a lot, there hasn't been a lot said about right. the submarine side of things, right. even less has yes. been said on those yeah. eight other yeah. areas, which I think is really unfortunate right. because, you know, if we're not getting SSNs until 2040, yeah. those, should be... those eight other lines of efforts yeah. are the things that right. need to deliver much more quickly. Right. And so far, we're not hearing a lot. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's a great a place to end it, I think. Uh, we've, we've solved nothing, unfortunately, but I think we had a lot of great ideas. Uh, and I really commend your piece, uh, Marcus, to everyone, because a yes. uh, terrific way of thinking through the, the messy middle, you know, of how do we address what's going to happen in the next 10 to 20 years rather than what's going to happen by 2040. And, mm -hmm. and Mark Gunzinger, thank you very much for being here today to give us your expertise and the benefit of your, your bomber knowledge. And thank you, Brian. <laughs> thank you, Marcus. Thank you, friend. Uh, and thank you all for being with us today. And from the Hudson Institute, uh, we appreciate you uh, your support and have a great day.